गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन इट इज़ माई प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ अ सूटेबल एजेंसी एंड सुंदर नर्सरी टू अ वंडरफुल न्यू सेशन ऑफ सूटेबल कॉन्वर्सेशन एट सुंदर नर्सरी दिस सीरीज ऑफ कॉन्वर्सेशन वॉज फर्स्ट इंस्पायर्ड बाई आर लव फॉर ऑल थिंग्स बुक्स एंड अ सूटेबल एजेंसी इज एक्सट्रीमली ग्रेटफुल टू एवरी वन एट सुंदर नर्सरी फॉर देर सपोर्ट एंड इनकरेजमेंट इन मेकिंग दिस हैपन देर वुड बी नो सूटेबल कॉन्वर्सेशन विदाउट दैम and now for the event we've been waiting for vanishing landscapes is an urgent and necessary conversation and we are fortunate to have two extraordinary voices here with us working across south asia independent photographer writer and national geographic geographic explorer arthi kumar rao documents environmental degradation that has reached catas- cataclysmic levels she chronicles how drastically depleting groundwater habitat destruction and land acquisition for industry devastates biodiversity and shrinks common lands displacing millions and pushing species towards extinction arthi was named in the bbc 100 influential and inspiring women from around the world in 2023 her first book margin lands indian landscapes on the brink published by pan mac in india in june 2023 was shortlisted at both the atta galata uh, bangalore lit fest and tata lit live awards 2023 arthi's work also has also appeared in the national geographic magazine emergence magazine bbc outside source and in leading indian newspapers among other outlets neha sinha is a conservation biologist and author she has worked on amur falcon conservation environmental policy and wetlands and uh, has a special penchant for animals considered ugly her first book is a critically acclaimed wild and willful tales of 15 iconic indian species she is an inlex scholar and is also a popular columnist on wildlife nature and our relationship with the wider world she has won awards both for her wildlife conservation work and her writing welcome and over to both of you thank you so much for that introduction thank you so much for having us thank you himali this is one of my favorite trees the samal with the red flowers and as we are speaking there is a black drongo a crow a bunch of babblers in the tree and hornbills have just come in that's a hornbill yeah. gray hornbill yeah. right there one of the most striking things about arti kumar rao's work is the fact that she has a multitude of voices in them so she might be interviewing a couple of fishermen in the bay of bengal sitting in a boat with them but she mentions the sound of the gecko that she hears she might be looking at a dolphin whose cries or sounds we cannot hear but she makes sure she talks about the way they ripple the water when they jump in and out she waits 90 seconds for the dolphin to resurface so she can take a photograph that is because she's not just a writer but also a photographer par excellence and also an illustrator and just somebody who sees the world very deeply i remember the time when arti had a long piece out in the hindustan times and she said and i think she had messaged me she said i wish i had a i had 5000 words to tell my story and i think the piece was 4000 words something if i'm not wrong which is quite a lot for a mainstream newspaper but she wanted more words she was hungry to tell the story of the multitude of lives that she found around her in margin lands she not just talks about people and animals but also about landscapes therefore my first question arti is tell us the process of bringing this monumental book together it spans many geographies it has so many voices i'm sure it's thousands of pages of notes so tell us a bit about how you sift through all of that and how you come to write a book which is probably decades of work if not more thank you neha thanks everyone for being here thanks a suitable agency and himali for having me um and thank you for this wonderful background score that we have it's just glorious um how did this book come about i have uh, tista to thank for that hi uh, she brought the idea to me almost 6 years ago now saying why don't you write a book for us i had no idea that i would be writing a book at that time i had 
wasn't even sure anybody would want to read what I write. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't done in one fell swoop. It happened over the years. It started with my journey to the desert in 2013 when I was introduced to an ecosystem like no other. And uh, thanks to Pradeep, who is here, and thanks to um, Chatar Singh, who was my guide and shepherd, uh, a shepherd farmer from the desert. Um, and I think uh, because I kept going back, you know, and I saw so many things change with the seasons, with, uh, with the years as well, um, I just realized that this is something that needs to be uh, documented in some way. Um, following in the footsteps of, uh, and, and I could never match, of course, um, Anupam Mishra, who had done amazing work in the desert. But um, I think Chatar Singh showed me a completely different way of seeing than what I was used to. And um, I just wanted to put all of that down. And I remember calling my editor at the time, Prem Panikar, up saying, uh, I know I've come here to do one story, but this story is going to take more than a year. And uh, I'm not going to be able to t give you anything when I come back this time. And he was generous to a, he's generous to a fault, um, but he was also he also had the foresight to see that you know this kind of a landscape needed uh, that kind of investment of time. And so that's how it began. The journey began, and um, I wish I had kept better notes. I must say. So yes, I have tons and tons of notes as well as photographs because that's how I also document um, and little drawings in my book and so on. Um, but uh, some of these issues that you may encounter in margin lands are so complex um, that I had, it took me a lot of words to even tr to try and understand them. So it only behooved that I, you know, I would use that kind of time and give it that kind of space to explore those issues. Um, so I just wanted more words. That's what I meant when I said I wish I had 5,000 at that time to write. Um, and so these are many 5,000 words coming together. And um, thanks to Tista's idea, and when I started putting the book together, I think it began to make sense because these stories are not in isolation. And when put together, they actually made me understand what I have been seeing over the last decade uh, so much better. So that's how, uh, and I think that's that's what is there today in those books. So it's a learning and unlearning and seeing and seeing again, right? Yes. And there's also that sense of seasonality in this book in so many ways. You wait for the monsoon. Uh, you look at the river as a kind of pulse over the land in which it's, it swells, it kind of shrinks, etc. But speaking about the desert, I feel you've peeled the desert back in a way that is very unusual. And it's a very new kind of a way that even I, as a reader, am experiencing. So she writes about these dunes, which are made of some layers of gypsum, and how those gypsum dunes have water, the Rejwari wells. So people are digging those wells. They have traditional ecological knowledge. They see the land as something that's even bountiful, um, even if it's the desert. And then there are the fossil wells, which are the more difficult patali kuas, right? So in so many ways, when we see the desert, uh, we see an absence of life. And you have characterized the desert as full of life. You've characterized the people of the desert as people who see that life and value it. So did the desert change you? And tell us more about the desert. Absolutely. Um, I mean, besides the fact that this was the beginning of my journey, uh, I think I had the, uh, the real good fortune of having two amazing mentors uh, through my journey in the desert. As I mentioned, Pradeep, and then two of our friends, uh, Harsha, Payal, and I, we would uh, explore the desert, uh, you know, walking the dunes, walking across the dunes, walking across the parts that are not dunes, uh, and, you know, looking at every little thing that came up. And if any of you knows Pradeep Krishan, you know how he observes. And that taught me how to actually see in the desert. 
And then I, after that part was done, I would extend the trip and then go and spend time with Chatar Singh, who had a completely different take because his is, you know, he's looking at the desert as a shepherd would yeah. and, um, and a farmer would. There are desert farmers, traditional desert farmers. And so I would learn that way of life and how they use and traverse and negotiate the desert. And so I think through 2013 and 2014, I, it was like a, uh, a hockey curve of learning for me. I was just, there was so much to know, and I don't think I even have begun to peel back what the desert really is. It's such a wonderful creature, and it's a living, breathing creature. And um, I think it's just the beginning that is there in Margin Lands. And um, it made me look at things completely differently. And I think most importantly, it made me slow down. Because the desert cannot be hurried. Neither can Chatar Singh, neither can nature, none of them. So you just have to then you know, change the way you do things so that you can um, follow that rhythm of life. And I think uh, some of the changes, and, and there's also a forbearance among the people in the desert, which which I think our city slickers have lost. And there's a connect with the land. They can read land, which is even just changing very minimally. For To our eyes, it's absolutely like, I mean, like what? And then they'll tell you, no, look at how this changes from this. Or now there are 36 different seeds buried in this area because you know they know the history of that land. And so a lot of that was, uh, was learning for me. And I continue to learn. And, Chatra Singh even now calls me, telling me what's happening in the desert, and we we exchange notes, and it's it's. Uh, I think it was just the most wonderful learning experience. Mm. You're speaking of Chatar Singh, and I want to draw attention to the many names for clouds people in the desert have, and even though they have clouds for such few days of the year, particularly rain clouds are so sparse, they still have this vocabulary for it, which is extremely nuanced. It's extremely specific and generous. It's a generosity of looking at the world. And I feel through your work, you're trying to create a thesaurus of experience, uh, a glossary for the landscape. I notice that you collect words like a dragon would collect gold. And I, I think it's fabulous because even as a bird watcher, we have so many different names for birds in different languages. And sometimes the regional names are far more interesting than the boring Latin names that we know, like the red wattle lapping is the tateri in Hindi because it makes a tateri tateri sound. Makes perfect sense. The gorns called the dove uh, farfari, probably because it flaps its wings like that. And there's a kind of poetry to um, to looking at different things, different experiences throughout the season and giving them different names. Tell us a bit more about this quest to collect a glossary for the landscape. Um, so language has always fascinated me and different words that different people, like you said, have for um, for things that we would probably even overlook. Like, just to, to name another one, uh, the marsh harrier is, uh, in, in Tamil, is actually called the one with a face like a cat. Yeah. So, you know, it's all observation. And I think it comes down to that, the keen observation that these people have for the landscape and how um, that then brings with it an importance, you know, and a reverence and a respect. I wouldn't say reverence, actually, scratch that. It's more a respect for the land, because reverence need not be accompanied by respect, which is something that you bring up in Wild and Willful, Willful too, when, it, when you talk about the elephant. Um, so it's a respect. It's a, uh, it's a naming with, with thought, with observation. And uh, the people of the desert, like you said, um, Oh my, we have some visitors. I know. So cute. So, nice. <laughs> um, so the. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, so the people of the desert, for example, call uh, cirrus clouds titar pankhi. 
because it's it's like the wing feathers of serrated. Uh, yeah serrated yeah. feather feathers of uh, of the uh, partridge, and so it's all um, it's all observation, and I think that is the deepest respect one can pay to the landscape that nurtures you, that supports you. And again, it's something that we have lost. For us, it's trees, you know. Yeah. It's just all green is green kind of thing, you know. So there's like, a, there's like a mass overlooking of the particular. And that particular, that, that memory of how that connects to the larger picture, connects to the next thing, gets lost when you just kind of gloss over things. And um, to reclaim that was really what uh, I was trying to do with the, with the landscape glossary, um, inspired by Rob McFarlane's effort in, in Scotland and, uh, and, in, um, and in Europe to do that. And uh, also, uh, when I read Barry Lopez, I realized that all of these people have paid mind to this, the, the importance of language, because that it keeps things, it gives place names, it gives things importance, and that then forms the voice memory over the land, which is very important for preserving, conserving something. And so um, I invite all of you to join um, me in trying to reclaim this landscape glossary through our languages, through our native tongues, and uh, through our uh, landscapes that we are familiar with, that people we know might be familiar with, that we are losing. Because really, um, the kind of, uh, maybe even the kind of education that we are having um, these days, it kind of does not relate back to the landscape that we are from. And that was one of the things that Chatar Singh mentioned, saying, my son doesn't know the names of these clouds because he goes to a school, which has a curriculum like, you know, a very standardized curriculum. And that's what got me then thinking and starting um, collecting names as well. So uh, I invite you guys to reclaim, you know, that, uh, that memory, those memories of the landscapes and adding to this glossary. And let's try and build this up so that um, we never, never, ever, ever lose respect for the land. So when I was growing up, we had these fruits in Delhi. Um, the falsa, the kidney, um, lokat, and you don't get that so much anymore. So I think that's already we are losing these words, jungle jalebi, etc. <laughs> Tell me what your favorite words are from the landscapes in this book. Ah, uh, that's like asking to and choose between. And there's a p foul behind you. Oh wow! With it's a big p. one. Yeah, big one. Beautiful one too. <laughs> Um, so, I, asking me to choose my favorite names. Uh, uh, like you can, you can. No, Maybe no, no, ten no. of them. Oh, no, not ten. I'll tell you one, though, because that, again, goes back to the beginning of this quest. And again, you know, since Pradeep is here, I'm just going to invoke that. When we were traveling through the desert, um, Pradeep said there must be something different about this particular part of the landscape versus the... Um, the other part of the landscape. And he was able to see these differences. And he said, you know, the Thar desert, um, you know, the Thar, which means the land uh, without life. And, you know, it's, uh, it's the, the dead land beyond, which is the, the dunes. But there was so much life in, the, in, in another part where the dune ends and then there's, you know, a different kind of uh, soil with different kind of um, uh, three, three or four different kinds of um, uh, flora. And he said, there must be some named for it. And we asked a lot of people. Again, a lot of this memory has been lost, so that we didn't come up with that name. But then we went back to history, and we found it. Found the word Roy mentioned in, in historical, uh, in a gaz gazette from 1800s sometime. And, uh, and then we realized, then we started asking people about it, and then it did come up, like, oh, yeah, this part is called Roy. And so, you know, it's... We could tell that this is being lost already, but I think that was, again, it's, it was the beginning of my journey on this quest. And um, I think that, therefore, will be one of my favorite names. Words, sorry, not names. So I have to tell you then, one of my favorite names is Shehgosh, which is um, the black 
eared one. Sh sh Sher is from Siahi. So the Shegosh is the Indian caracal. I was just which going is, to guess. Is it the caracal? Yes. <laughs> the Indian caracal, which is a medium-sized cat found in India. It's locally extinct in many places now. I did my field work in Saraska. And the old people would say my favorite animal is Shegosh. And the young people had no clue because they hadn't seen it. So it's a generational amnesia of sorts. And in fact, the caracal is vanishing from most parts of India. And I think it's almost on the verge of extinction. But that's another word that's so evocative. And we don't even know the word. People know tigers and other animals, but not Shegosh, which is a pity. Uh, another point that you made about seeing the land and the nuances of it. So many times our introduction to landscapes are basically because of acts of violence or acts of you know, natural disaster. So we think about the Himalayas when it rains a lot and the dams break and people die because they are floods. We think about Sundarbans when islands disappear or we think about Yamuna River in Delhi. <laughs> when it breaks its banks every monsoon. But we don't seem to think about landscapes, as you said, in, in a way that get, pays attention to the system that it actually is, because it's all so connected. And we often think we are fixing the system. You write extensively about the Faraka Barrage. And as a Bengali who has eaten Hilsa fish, <laughs> uh, there, there are no more uh, Hilsa f fish to be found in the Ganga and the Padma. And that's because of the barrage. And um, there are these sea walls that you have in southern India, which have made sea erosion much worse. You have this whole system of dams and embankments coming up like fungus everywhere. Right, so we think we are fixing things. You write about the Indira Gandhi Canal in this book and how it brought so-called prosperity, but it also brought invasive species, it brought mosquitoes where there were no mosquitoes. It brought a completely different sort of set of values from what the way the life in the desert was. So tell us a bit more about this. You hint at the political ecologies behind this. But tell us a bit more about this pension to fix things, and then we think it's fixed. In fact, we're making it much worse. Yeah, Neha, actually, this is a good, good question. And uh, it's, it's almost like a malaise um, of our times, where uh, we look at things piecemeal. You know, We just see a part. We identify an issue in a part. And we think we, if we fix that, it's going to get fixed. However, that issue itself is a symptom of something larger, something maybe even removed temporally or geographically. And um, fixing that does nothing. And that's exactly what happened with the Faraka Barash, where it was supposed to fix the, the silting of the, um, of the Calcutta port, but it ended up doing far worse. And that didn't even fix the Calcutta port uh, anyways. So. Um, I think when we pay attention to symptoms and try to just fix the symptoms, we're really doing nothing other than either transferring or just delaying the issue itself. And uh, we find ourselves in all the issues that we have today. You brought up dikes. You brought up embankments. That's a colonial hangover that we seem to think is the best way forward. And really, what, what, what a dike or an embankment does is that it cuts off the wetlands from the main stem of the river. The wetlands are the kidneys. They are the fish nurseries. They are what keeps the river alive. And um, when you think you can tame the river and you can straight jacket it into, uh, into flowing in one, one, um, in one way, uh, it doesn't do that. And then we have floods every year, which we'll say, oh, the river flooded again. Well, really, it's not the river that it's meant to flood. That's a floodplain. Most of these places where a river floods is a floodplain. It's meant to flood. And the, the farmers who work in those floodplains, those food bowls, know and know to wait for the silt that comes with the river, which replenishes and creates some of the most fertile lands in India. But we think it's a bad thing, because now floods are a bad thing. Also because the way we have thought about it, built in embankments and then given people the false sense of security of building behind the embankments their villages, 
which then when the embankment breaks and, the villi and it floods, um, there's loss of life. So not to romanticize the floods, but if we do things to the river, it's that that devastates. It's not the river itself that devastates. And so it really comes down to what are we fixing? What is the problem? So actually identifying the problem in the first place, which might not even be a problem, it's just a way of life or it's just the way the landscape behaves, and then imposing something that we want on that landscape, which is anathema to the way everything around it behaves, you can't expect good things to happen. Yeah. And so I think it's a mindset, it's a colonial hangover, and it's not to do with the color of skin. It's to do with a mindset. Because even among us, we have so many people who think a certain way, which has not helped. And, um, and truly, I think, A, identifying the problem, like you mentioned, uh, the erosion in, uh, in Kerala, 63% of Kerala's beaches are eroded. And that's it's terrible. And why? Because of things that we did to that um, that coastline, which prevented something called the longshore drift, which replenishes the uh, the beaches on its own. Right. So um, I think stepping back to see what is it that we are doing to the landscape, and how are we imposing our will on the landscape, and that will not really holding up with time or with how the landscape behaves. And therefore, listening to the land instead would be, I think, you know, a fab. And again, this has not got to do with any one company or one corporation or one party. Um, it's not that. It's, it's a mindset. And it's a mindset that has been, you know, over the ages. Um, and I think it ha there, are, there are sane voices among us. And I think it behooves us to listen to those. It's almost like we worship concrete. Our, you know, our places of worship are basically concrete mills. We have to concretize everything all the time. Temples of modern India. Temples of modern India. I mean, I don't want. I didn't want to use the word temple. I mean, <laughs> For a temple reasons. as a place yes. of worship, like you said. So yes. So yeah. uh, yes, concrete as the solution uh, for everything. I I wanted to draw attention to. Uh, the way you've characterized animals in this book. Mm -hmm. So I think your main priority is to talk about the people and the land, but of course the animals sneak in. So I'm going to ask you the question that I think about all the time myself as a writer, which is how do we characterize wild animals which have their own agency, their own will, their own willfulness, and their own sort of schedule in life? Um, I often wonder if I'm getting it wrong, because we, ha we have this rights of nature movement right now in which we want to uh, talk about the river being represented in a particular way or, an, or a wild bird or a, or a wild animal. Um, I'm remembering the passage on the dolphins from mm -hmm. your book. But tell me, how do, you, how do you fill in the blanks for the things that we don't know about the non-human? Uh, when we are writing about the non-human, how, how do you fill in those blanks? Do you think we're getting it wrong? Or do you think it's funny they're laughing at us, perhaps? <laughs> um, I have no idea. I don't know how they think. Um, and I think what I've tried with Marginlands is to try and represent a part of the landscape in its entirety. Yeah. So if it is the Bias River, it is the fishermen who use the river, it's the dolphins who use the river, it's the stray dogs, the feral dogs that are on those sandbars, it is the... Um, the Sarkanda grass farmer who is rowing, you know, all of that. So it's really my experience of that landscape that I have tried to bring forth in the book without, maybe I wasn't intelligent enough to even think through some of these things of, you know, what are they thinking or what are they doing? It was like what I was experiencing, what I was seeing that I tried uh, to put in the book. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, again, there's something that, uh, that Barry Lopez says in his, uh, in his book. Um, I think it's in About This Life, which is a collection of essays. He says that um, there are some um, indigenous cultures in, um, in North America who, who have observed something about the wolverine. And there are other indigenous cultures also who also live with the wolverine 
who have probably who have probably observed something different about the Wolverine. And so when you ask one, what do you say about this kind of observation that comes from a different yeah. uh, tribe? Uh, they say they do not diss it. They do not uh, completely negate it. They do not do any of that. What they say is maybe it's like that too. Because we don't know what, what's happening when we're not looking. Yeah. You know, So we don't know how things are behaving when, we, when we're not looking. And I think allowing for that and allowing for that wonder is really important. And I think, let me, let me throw that back to you. How, do you. how do you approach it? And of course, there's no right answer or anything in this, right? It's just a different approach. How do you approach it in Wild and Willful, where you are representing so many creatures and you're talking about so many hard, hard stories about them? How did you tackle the same thing? Well, I started off with spite and malice against all the ways that animal names are used as abusers. <laughs> so <laughs> vultures as being predatory and opportunistic and greedy like politicians. Like why are all politicians shown as vultures? It's really annoying because vultures are majestic and patient and beautiful and politicians are not those things. And right? important too. Yeah. They're important yes. too. <laughs> vultures are important. Politicians are not. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I started off with not wanting, by, by wanting to create new words for animals, like as majestic as a vulture, as, as patient as a tiger mother, because tiger cubs are really irritating. They really annoy the mother a lot. And in my field observations, I always see the relationships that animals have to each other, rather than them being monolithic. Because so many times we are so solipsistic in our writing. We talk about our feelings. and But with animals, I feel they're always connected to something else around them. So even at, like an ashiprenia in your garden, it's doing something in relation to another animal or in relation to another living or non-living thing in your garden. So for me, I, I, I've made a list of like their activities and I tried to draw a portrait or a character sketch. Maybe I'm totally wrong. I don't know. But I do think they have certain dominant characteristics. And uh, you know, I, I think that that makes them peculiar, interesting. And I think it's really nice to be willful. Because willful is used like a bad word. You know, like a, a student who doesn't do her homework on time is a willful child. or. A student who doesn't listen, or you know, somebody who has their own ideas, you know, resistance and willfulness. But living a life of resistance, I think, is a good life. Uh -huh. So, a wild animal being willful is a wild animal exerting its agency in a life which is heavily influenced and modified by us. So I've tried to also draw that portrait as a response to walls coming up in elephant corridors or tigers not being able to cross very big highways. Or these they guys. Agree, they agree. Yeah. They agree with you. <laughs> so I wrote Wild and Willful during the pandemic. And these guys were so much more louder. They were not louder. Rather, we were quieter. So I would keep having my Twitter followers say things like, there's a dinosaur in my garden, like a monitor lizard. So like never seen before. I'm like, they're really common. They're really helpless and harmless. It's not going to bite you. It's not a dinosaur. And uh, the animals were always there. We just saw them a bit more during the pandemic. And I, I, I think being willful, being a willful animal is being a good animal. Mm -hmm. I think our definition of what is good is a definition that's about conformity. But wild animals always break our borders and our orders. They break political boundaries. They break state boundaries. They break our expectations. There's a leopard in someone's bathroom. There's a tiger in someone's kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. But I think uh, I, I don't see that as a bad thing. And also, the question also of venomous snakes or animals that can harm us. The question on whether they should exist, whether they have the altruistic right to exist, even as something that can harm and take away our life. And I think the answer is a resounding yes. So the King Cobra chapter in the book is about how cobras are not evil. Cobra, cobras are just what they are. Mm -hmm. They use their venom for their own purposes. And I think with the venom also comes great restraint. 
which I don't find in a lot of people, I have to say. I'm sounding misanthropic when I say that. But with great power, great restraint, I see that a lot in wild animals because I would be dead otherwise. Because, you know, in the Indian forest when we're walking, there are tigers and leopards and elephants and snakes, but we are fine, right? We are, we are fine because it was an act of grace from their end, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. So one thing I wanted to uh, just add to what Neha says where she talks about labeling animals, I think we do the same with landscapes. How many times have you heard that it's deserted to mean something bad, right? The desert is a wonderfully living creature. How many times have you heard drain that swamp or the swamp to mean something that's terrible, right? Um, a swamp is one of the most uh, productive ecosystems on Earth, right? Um, how many times have you heard that, oh, you're going to create a desert or desertification, something I absolutely detest because it's actually dust bowlification, if I had to say, if I had to use a word, because what we create when we create uh, unproductive spaces. We're creating dust bowls. We're not creating deserts. Deserts are beautiful places, you know. They're different, but they're beautiful as well. So I think vilifying animals, vilifying landscapes, it comes down again to language. And, and unfortunately, none of us is immune from it. How many times have we called somebody an ass? An ass is a wonderfully hardworking creature. I have walked 600 kilometers with an ass, and I know that. And, and so has Lovelyn, Raju. who's saying something. Wasn't here. his name Raju? Raju. Yes. Yeah. And so has Lovelyn, who's sitting here in the audience. And we know what a wonderfully sweet creature he was, and hardworking and intelligent. Actually, by some cases, they say uh, donkeys are more intelligent than even horses. So, how many times do we call people asses? How many times do we say, hey, wo to ullu hai? Oh my God, an owl is to be revered. You know, it's such a wonderful creature, right? So let us also step back and check our own language because when we speak, so is our thought, so is our action, so is our intent. And vilifying creatures as well as landscapes leads to calling them vermin and then, you know, kind of mass extermination of so many things, right? Um, like you talk about uh, the leopard being called a pest, right? When you think pest, like that. Murderer, pest, rogue, exactly, criminal. Exactly, right? So when you, a rogue elephant, this was a rogue elephant, right? So when you think like that, you assign a certain emotion to, to that creature, and then it's very easy to de, well, dehumanize, but also de, uh, you know, just allow that somebody to just completely exterminate that creature. So I think language, it comes back to language and how important it is for us to just watch how we portray these things, labels. Shall we end with some book recommendations? Tell us about the authors that you love. You can have as many as you want. OK. Um, I love Rachel Carson's works, Beyond um, the Silent, Silent Spring. Spring. Yeah, Beyond the Silent Spring. She writes a lot about, um, about the sea and about the margins, um, the edges of the sea, so, so mangroves, all of that. Wonderful works, wonderful works. Um, I also love Barry Lopez's work, um, and then uh, Rob McFarlane, of course, we share that. Um, recently read a beautiful book by Bathsheba Demuth called The Floating Coast, highly rec recommend that. She tells the story of capitalism through Wales and through the history of Beringia. Fabulous, fabulous book. Um, I'm forgetting, but then of course there's a lot of uh, a lot of no, uh, fiction as well, which which is also wonderful. My all-time favorite is still Grapes of Wrath, um, which again I feel those interstitial chapters which set up the story. He keeps going back to those interstitial chapters, and I just love the way he does that. Um, so, yeah. I'm just gonna add to that list with some Indian names. Because I think Indian nature writing has been born just now, I think. Because it, traditionally, we grew up on Ken Anderson and you know these white men with guns, like killing everything. Jim Corbett, of course, was a conservationist, but he was still like shooting poachers. But right now, we have these decolonized voices, very 
you know, voices of the land, voices that are very much their own. So I have to name a few books which I encourage everyone to read. So there's Mihir Vatsa's Tales of Hazari Bagh. Mihir is here in the audience. Um, there's Yuvan Ave's um, Intertidal. Uh, Yuvan's yes, yes, Intertidal. Um, and there's also, of course, Aarti Kumar Rao, who I love a lot. Uh, but I think and uh, I can't take my own name. I'm taking it. <laughs> Neha Sina, who's sitting right here. I think we're in a very interesting point in the way that we look at nature and the way that we want to talk about it in a manner that's complex, problematized, but very real. And I think we're finally moving away from the shikar literature that we were known for. So I think this is a great time to be a reader, not just a writer. Mm -hmm. Shall we open up for questions? Absolutely. OK, we'll take questions. Very good evening. Um, it, it, we are talking about landscapes, and you know it's a perfect day to talk about landscapes. Just look around you. I mean, just look at the back. Uh, the like, you know, it's it's just a beautiful day to talk about landscapes. So, um, and also, I really appreciate how Neha Sena Ma'am is dressed up in a way that she's carrying all the colors today. So, my question, RT Ma'am. Um, could you share any one incident which, uh, like, where you felt you were kind of divinely placed to experience some of the things and then put them forward in your language, in your style, in your individualistic style? Like in some situation where nature actually spoke to you, nature actually disclosed some of its secrets, and you, RT, you have to go back and come on. You have to bring it up, write it in your own words, and present it to the world. Any one situation where you felt, OK, this was just a gift from the nature of the landscape to me, and I have to present it to the world. Thank you for that question. Um, I think one, one thing that comes to mind immediately was, that, uh, was something that was completely a big surprise to me. I didn't expect this to happen. We were walking through uh, Punjab, um, and we had covered, we we'd, uh, started at the Vaga border, and we had covered uh, land up till about Taran Taran. And uh, we had come down to Harike, when my, my, uh, the person I was walking with, which is Paul Salopek, fell sick. He fell violently sick there. And so we, was, we were parked there for a while. And um, Harike is a big wetland and all of that, right? So, but then there was something, um, when I was just kind of scrolling, I had seen on Wikipedia, which said that Indus dolphins were seen there in 2007. And for me, Indus dolphins, I thought, were in Pakistan. I did not ever expect to see Indus dolphins in my life. And I've tried to get a Pakistan visa, and I've not gotten it. So, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so. I didn't think I'd ever see one. And then uh, when Paul was sick, I decided to just go to the river side and see if I could spot a dolphin. I mean, how could you, right? I mean, so I just went there. And I was standing uh, at the edge of the river. I took a taxi, went to the edge of the river, a little further upstream from Harike. And um, I saw a boatman coming you know, in his boat, long, low boat, rowing slowly with a lot of grass, sarkanda grass. And um, when he came, he was offloading the grass. And I just asked him, I said, Yaan pe bhulan dekha hai kya? And I was expecting him to say, what, kya? You know, nahi, yaan pe nahi, bahut saal ho gaye, all that stuff. This was 2018. So, um, and he said, huh, abhi to dekha, do ja rahe the wahan pe. <laughs> and I was like, no, what? And I, then I said, can I just come in your boat? He said, I'm ferrying people back and forth. If you want to sit in my boat, you're welcome to. That's exactly what I did. Jumped in the boat and just sat as he went back and forth, you know, kind of uh, swinging, oscillating between two banks of the river Bias. And within 10 minutes, I saw my first Indus dolphin. Not It was where you're sitting if I was on the boat. And it just, if you know how the river dolphins behave, they do not jump up and twirl and all of that. It's just a gentle breaking of the surface and softly going back in. No sound, just a lovely curve, arc, and back in. I couldn't believe it. And then there was one more. Then there was a mother and a calf. So I came back every day. My luck held. I came back every day. And I think 
we have a total of maybe 11 of those dolphins in India, so on this side of the dam. And, uh, and I saw four of them. And I was crying. I think, unfortunately, if you are a very professional videographer, you don't speak or say things when you're taking the video. And here I'm going, oh my god, look, I can't believe it. Oh my god, <laughs> you know, all of that. And so can't use any of the audio from the, from the, <laughs> from the videos. But it was just something that I think has been one of my absolutely, I think I was just blessed and full of gratitude for that experience. You're not the only one who does that <laughs> crying when <laughs> you see an incredible animal. Yeah. Are there more questions? Yes, over there in the back. I thank you for a lovely, lovely conversation. I just wanted to uh, mention one or two of my favorite authors as uh, M. Krishnan, who I think is a, one of the early generations of really wonderful uh, writers on wildlife, and recently Ashish Piti, and Anita Mani's excellent women in, in wildlife in India, featuring people like yourselves, perhaps yourselves, I don't can't quite remember, and especially the story of Jamal Ara. And um, I would I'd like to ask you whether you think the problem is that we're living in the modern world as most people do now. You are so disconnected from nature, and that's why the love of concrete, and uh, how to chip away really at this disconnectedness and arrogance, the human, natural human arrogance. Natural human arrogance, I agree, I agree. Uh, Women in the Wild is such a special book. Thank you for mentioning that. The chapter that I have in it is about Ghazala Shahabuddin and the oak forest she studies in Uttarakhand. And the oak forests are almost as endangered as, say, um, an ecosystem like cloud forests, etc., because the pines are really in ingressing. So according to her studies, the more complex oak with many more sort of layers is not being valued because the pine forest also looks like a forest. It's simpler, it's more linear. It's green looking, but it doesn't harbor the same birds or the same biodiversity that an oak forest does have. And I think that's the problem. We have simplified nature to such an extent that we are happy to see plastic grass, which people just carpet on top of everything. And we've also idealized nature in a way that does not allow for nature to be angry or willful or, or just itself. So, I mean, I, I don't think nature exists to serve us and always be pretty beautiful. And it c certainly doesn't exist as a very simple thing, that the way, the way we want to look at it. And I think the only answer is to go out in the forest. And India is blessed with so many wild spaces. So it's not just forests. It's also grasslands. It's also wetlands. It's also uh, mangroves and... Um, Your back garden. <laughs> Your garden. Yeah, you know, I was just going to backyard say. Backyard garden. In fact, one of my favorite passages from her book is on the carpenter bees that she sees in her little garden in, in Bangalore. And during COVID, in my little so-called garden, which is actually on the third floor, I feel like it saved my life because of the birds and the bees and the diversity of bees that came to the garden. And seeing rosy starlings that migrate in April, not being able to go to them, but seeing them. So for me, it kind of saved my life because we were very sick. But I think for the others, the answer is just more walks. Just like go out there, get bitten, get, you know, get stung by thorns and enjoy that as part of the experience. It's, it's, very, it's the antithesis of the virtual reality experience or the AI experience where everything is very dramatic or very friendly. I think nature is dramatic in different ways. It, you go to see the tiger and you never see the tiger. You, you can see many other things. And it's not comfortable in many ways, right? It's hot and it's cold. I was walking with Vijay Basmana in Aravli the other day. I have so many thorns in my skin after that. We were trying to see the Indian eagle owl, which we never found. But that's the point of it, just going out there and not getting what your goal is. 
I think being in nature is the opposite of this goal-oriented life in which we want to meet our goals all the time. That ramble, that meander, it's just so precious. I think the answer can only be us taking people out for walks. What do you think? Absolutely. I wanted, just add, I wanted to add something that you said about the disconnect really struck a chord. Um, there's, this, uh, there's this quote by Aldo Leopold from his Sand County Almanac, where he says, and this he wrote in 1949, uh, he says that civilization has so cluttered the elemental man-earth relationship with gadgets and middlemen that awareness of it is growing dim. We imagine industry is what supports us, forgetting what supports industry. Yeah. And I think that has become, you know, our lives, that we think the GDP and the shiny badge of the GDP is what we run after. But we are in serious danger of losing the moon and chasing the stars. And I think that is something that we really need to uh, get back. And to, to Neha's point about just getting out there, you know, cocooning ourselves in, in a car or in a bus or in a plane as a means of travel versus putting on a pair of walking shoes and just walking through places, uh, I think that's a small way of reclaiming that connection because you start seeing with all your senses and you start really experiencing you know, everything around, even if it is sweaty and it is uncomfortable. Uh, hi. There's um, a question at the back. Sorry. Could I take the question? Could I, could I yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, that all of these issues are extremely complex, you know. Uh, our generation seems to have got caught up with this whole idea of these are big projects, we need to sort them out. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Chhatar Singh in the book, and uh, what really troubles me about a lot of what we are doing to nature is what's happening to communities. So whether it is the water diviners or it's the Raika in, in, in Rajasthan, um, you know, us elder, uh, us, this generation seems to have got lost in these trying to do m these major projects. I want to tap into you younger lot. What is the way out for preserving those communities? We've got lost somewhere. Maybe you have good ideas. Maybe you have new ideas. I mean, your book is amazing. Thank you for writing it. Thank you. Uh, and how do we get away from these interlopers who are making life so difficult? Thank you for that question. It's almost like as if I planted you there to ask this question. <laughs> because there's something that I harp about a lot, and that is paying attention to local geographies. I think these interlopers get agency when the people have forgotten their local geographies. And I think it behooves all, every one of us, wherever we are, whether we're in Nizamuddin or we're in, uh, you know, Gurgaon, to understand what that land can bear what that land is, what it has, what it's meant to be, and how it has been, and reclaim that, restore that. And if we don't know that, and we can't stand and fight for that, then who are we to complain about the interlopers who are there with their marketing dollars and their, you know, grandiose ideas to come, and then they'll just hijack everything. So I think that whole thing of of Wendell Berry, where he says, um, "What I stand for is what I stand on." is really what needs to drive us all, no matter what generation. And I think if we can somehow just get that and fight for that in our own small way. For I come from a place called Bangalore, which is in the news right now, which, no even, though, <laughs> which even though it gets twice the amount of rain that is needed for its uh, sustenance is running out of water. If only we could stand for what we stand on and understand how Belandur behaves versus how Yelahanka behaves and you know, do right by that, I think a lot of things can be solved. And I think that's what people need, really need to even teach in schools and uh, you know, education needs to be that. Local, how can, you, how can you survive in your locality and what do you need to do for that? I think we're kind of, we've lost that, we've gone so far away from that that I think every one of us needs to do a little bit to reclaim that. Just to add to that, uh, I was talking about the idealization of nature in which we don't account for its complexities. So we, we have these zoo and safari projects 
which are seen as a proxy for conservation. But conservation is not a zoo. Conservation is not a safari. Conservation is protecting a habitat with all its with all its excesses, with all its starvations, and all the difficulties it brings. So actually protecting a forest or a wetland means you're allowing the wetland to break its banks sometimes. You're allowing the forest to, uh, <laughs> sorry. You're allowing the forest to um, have a fire once in a while. Um, if you have bamboos in the forest, then you're going to have bamboo flowering, which causes issues for local communities because the rat population explodes. Now, the thing is, this is not comfortable, but then nature is not comfortable. We, we talk about nature like it's a goddess, but I'm not sure if that is the case. I'm not sure if it's something that is always looking to aid us or something that is a benefactor always. It is, it is very much a force in itself which, has, which brings difficulties, but we have to we have to face the fact that it is the basis of our life. How can the basis of our life come easy to us? And you know, as conservationists, we fight very hard to keep wild habitat wild and to keep it free of interference. But the words that we hear the most are mitigation, compensatory afforestation, and lately, conservation breeding, in which you breed an animal in a captive enclosure hoping that's a proxy for um, having the animal in the world. But the animal in the world needs to be from the habitat, in the habitat that it lives in, and not in a captive enclosure. Because being in a captive enclosure just saves the genes. It doesn't do anything for the habitat. A wild animal is inextricably linked to its wild habitat. And the two have to be seen together. And it's, it's, it, it's not an easy fight because we have we worship money it seems and like i said we worship concrete quite a bit as well so i think i don't know maybe our generation i think our generation also is more literate in all of this i don't know if you're having an impact in terms of changing policy but certainly i see a lot more people wanting to talk about this i think that's why we have so many people here there wasn't always an audience for nature writing or for bird watchers or bird walks. And now you have thousands and thousands of people who will spend their precious Saturdays and Sundays watching reptiles and birds and all kinds of other animals. And Bangalore is a hub for it, but so is Delhi. In Delhi, you have thousands of bird watchers who will go out every weekend in barren looking places, barren in you know a double inverted commas, just to see one bird, two birds, etc. There's one more thing that I would like to add to that, is that there's something called the Ecological Restoration Alliance, ERA, that has been set up. A bunch of people doing really good work restoring an ecosystem, not just planting trees or not just doing other greenwashing things. Um, and I think joining that or uh, being a part of that, even following that, if, you're, if, that, if, that's your, uh, if you're able to, uh, would would be also a place to start. And that is something that really gives us tremendous hope, that there are these people, and so many of them, in pockets albeit, but um, doing their bit to actually restore ecosystems. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Aarti. Hi. Hi, Neha. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, I I loved it. Uh, I also loved the book a lot. Uh, I have you. a lot of like most of my uh, most of the chapters are quite favorite, and I I really paid attention <laughs> to um, to you walking in these chapters, and I wanted to ask you about that experience of yours. As in, uh, did you have help in the like whenever you went out? to these places in terms of walking. Why I'm asking walking is also because I've also read Tales of Hazari Bagh by Mihir, and he also does a fabulous work with landscape. Uh, so uh, I, yeah, so that question about how do you, as a woman, do, like in terms of my reading, I see that male writers write differently about a landscape and women writers write differently. But you experiencing that, what can you say about your side? about walking. Second, I wanted to ask about you interacting with communities in the sense that uh, 
did you uh, like you're telling because I'm not saying that you're telling their stories, but in a way that, for example, talking to Chhatra Singh and writing about that, uh, how how do you navigate the um, questions that come behind that? You know, this is these are his point of view, so shouldn't he get the agency to talk about it? And for even for example, you travels to Assam and you talk about how women have a lot of issues traveling to one place to another. Uh, so yeah, like, uh, how do you write about what other people are, are facing in these places, and what what kind of thoughts go in your head? Sorry if this is too long. No, 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 that's fine. The first question about walking. Um, uh, is your question around safety more than anything else, or? Uh, yeah. So. Um, I think walking through landscapes allows you to be alive. You're not sleepwalking, like you would if you were sitting in a car and driving through it, you know, and just kind of sometimes looking out, sometimes looking at your phone. You know, it's, it's a different, it's a completely different way of traversing the landscape, right? You're, you have to put, you feel the landscape with your feet. You feel the landscape with your skin, with your eyes, ears, nose, you know, you can smell. And as a storyteller, all of those things are so important because they're all layers of information. You leave anyone out, you leave a whole part of the landscape out. In fact, smell. If all of you can take in a deep breath right now, there's a distinct smell in the air which will probably not be there across the road, right? So that is a layer of information which is so important if we were to write about this gathering here today, right? So. Um, the senses come alive when you are out there walking and feeling um, feeling the landscape with all of your senses. So that's one thing. Um, wherever I've gone, communities have adopted me in the sense that they're so welcoming and they're, you know, let's take you with us and show you how we see our land, you know? So they, I see it through their eyes. I hope, I really hope very, very ardently that in margin lands, it's not my voice that has come out, but I've really described how they see it because that's, tr who am I to, to tell that story? Who am I? I'm a newbie. And I, if there's one thing I've learned in those 10 years is the thing that I see the first time I go, the next time I go, I learn something completely different, which negates what I've seen the first time. So I know that even the 10th time I go, it's probably not the whole picture. I've seen, I know I'm seeing less than the people that actually live there. So I've tried really hard, and I really hope that has come through, to just um, describe what I have seen. Um, having said that, there's one thing that I do want to say. I wear my privilege very, it, it, it's, a, it's a real burden. Because some of these stories that are in margin lands are in very treacherous landscapes. The people have been through a lot. They have been uh, displaced multiple times, you know. And coming back from that to a roof over my head and hot food on the table, it was hard. And it, it, it just made me feel my privilege, my lottery of birth, literally, so acutely, because um, I could have easily been you know, on the other end as well. And so uh, that that weighed very heavily, but it also put in perspective that I have absolutely nothing to complain about ever because there's nothing that I can complain about when I have seen what it is like to live in a landscape that literally we, our lifestyle has devastated, you know? So um, it's complex. I know I'm going all over the place trying to answer your questions, but... Um, it's messy. It's not easy. It's complex. Complex is our favorite word. It's the word of the evening. Messy, clearly. complex. <laughs> I think we have to break soon for signings, but Radhika has a question. Uh, hi, hi, Artie. Hi, Neha. Hi. I love your work. I have your books. I'm hoping you'll sign them. Uh, we will. My question was really as a storyteller. And uh, you've written about landscapes of loss. Uh, Neha's written uh, about, uh, you know, landscapes that are dying. She's also an activist. And I was wondering, one, how do you hold on to hope, uh, knowing all that that's happening, and how do you weave in hope into your writing? 
especially because you know a lot of my family reads what this work and i keep forwarding these things to them and they say that everything you write about ends with it's going to die you know it's all gloom and doom uh so i was wondering how you hold on to wonder and hope and sort of weave it in perhaps in everything you do you go first you go first, <laughs> you go first. <laughs> um every time i've been really sad about my life there's been a bird that's come it's like they've taken it upon themselves to appear all you need are the eyes to see so i was telling about covid it's there in wild and willful how we were so sad and we were so sick and then we saw rosy starlings which migrate to india from central asia they made a long journey to come here and they come every year at the same time unfailingly they have their own clock they have their own wisdom they have their own flock behavior and i think when you observe nature it takes you out of the shit in your own life so if your life is about excel sheets and your salary that you're not happy with uh, your friends you fought with your family is complicated etc you observe a bird or an animal or even a plant it's just doing other things you know it 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 also has its own schedule it also has its own sense of time and i think i am look the squirrels now come on the stage so it's a willful squirrel um just to say that there's a, there's a feeling that animals are jungly which means that ungovernable or they are so lazy that they keep sleeping but i've never found that to be true i find them to be hard working they're always up to something they're mischievous they're playful and observing that animal uh, makes me forget about my own worries which actually are very small as as arti said in the scale of things our privilege our exposure that we've been lucky enough to have in terms of our education um and the fact that our parents supported us i think behind every female um environmentalist i don't know if this is a sweeping statement but i think behind every female environmentalist in india there's a family that has supported her in some way or the other because this is not a profession that um, many uh, it's not i guess it's not a very common profession or it is also male dominated this profession so that privilege of having someone in your family who supported you being able to see so much wildlife we have so much wildlife in india and i think that's amazing i mean just listen to these birds they're so crazy so i think to answer your question they just um, fill me with happiness because they're so funny and they're living their own lives and uh, that takes me out of the human condition out of my set of specific set of problems for the day i don't think my specific set of problems for the day are that important basically and it's a humbling experience to be in nature yeah so how do we find hope um i subscribe to a lot of what uh, neha just said in that keen observation keeps the wonder i mean even a blade of grass right with there's so much to see um and just that the act of observation keen observation close observation it just keeps the wonder alive and that for me is wonderful having said that when i'm in these landscapes meeting these people who have lost so much believe it or not their undying never say die um can do their willingness to do what it takes to make something happen um it gives me courage so it may not be hope as much but it gives me courage and it they are the ones who ask after me even when i've come back from and they are living in sh- in a, in a, under a tarpaulin with nothing they don't even have the next meal but 3 hours after i've left them they call me and say ponch gaye kya kaise ho sab theek hai you know it's that connect with that um, it's a very it's 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 being i think it's being connected with the whole that um that gives them that i do i'm i'm searching for the word i know that english has a word but it's it's a kind of uh, quality that is very um caring <laughs> sorry that's what i came up with after all that but um it's a quality that's very caring and that caring quality i have seen bar none in the in every place i've gone to everyone i've met 
And I feel that if they don't lose hope, if they don't have, they don't throw their hands up and say, oh, we're done, but they are trying to make their life happen, who am I to lose hope, you know? And I don't have that option. None of us have the option of losing hope. We have to do what it takes. I think that's, that's just what it is for me. I'll just pass the mic on to you. Yeah. But, uh, thank you so much for that amazing conversation and the chiming in from the landscape as well. Uh, it was really actually wonderful. Uh, thank you both very, very much from a suitable agency. Also, uh, both their books are available and Margin Lands is just out in paperback. So please, if you would like to purchase a copy or if you have your own copies, please, they're here for signing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.